Welcome to Insights with Carrie. Today our topic is making Jesus Lord. There are Christians who have made Jesus their Savior, but have never made Jesus Lord in their lives. Making Jesus Lord in your life is a decision for which God has given us grace. Many Christians don't fully understand the difference between Jesus being your Savior and Jesus being your Lord. And so they don't truly become a new creation in Christ Jesus. They don't realize the impact of sin on their lives. It is through making Jesus Lord in our lives that we receive pardon for our sins and admission to heaven. King David, when he finally realized that he had stepped away from God and had committed adultery with Bathsheba and then committed murder by ordering Bathsheba's, Bathsheba's husband to be killed, David then fell on his face in prayer and pleaded with God to give him a clean heart. He begs God to have pity on him. When you see a leper, it's obvious that he or she has leprosy because the leprosy is on the outside. It's visible on the skin. But the problem with sin, it's that it's on the inside, so we and others can't see it. The problem with sin is that it leaves a permanent mark, a permanent change in your heart and your character. Only God can give somebody a new, clean, undistorted heart. Scripture says that Adam and Eve were warned beforehand. In Genesis 2 17 it records, But of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you may not take, for on the day when you take of it death will surely come to you. So death would be their eventual outcome if they disobeyed God and chose to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It was a test, which unfortunately they flunked when they yielded to their lusts. There was only one item in the Garden of Eden that they were told to stay away from and not eat, yet they yielded to their lusts. In the Bible, it becomes clear that disobedience to God brings a spiritual separation or everlasting death. In thinking about this, pondering on it, I came to the conclusion that it has to do with rebellion. Rebellion is a seed that takes root quickly. The character or heart of the person is altered. The alteration may not be visible to the individual or others, but it is there nonetheless and the deviation it creates puts down deep roots quickly. Satan can recognize that deviation as he experienced it in heaven. And as the seed of rebellion grew in his heart, he became more and more bold in his rebellion. And he was able to persuade other angels, holy angels, to also rebel. He understands the courts of heaven and how they operate, and he knows that he can then, when somebody has sinned, he can then contend with God regarding the person's choice and ask for more access to that person based on the choice of having chosen Satan's previous suggestion over God's instructions. Remember that Satan and his angels sided with him in heaven and were expelled from heaven, and according to Revelation 20, verse 10, they will be burned in the lake of fire. So they will ultimately die an eternal death. Paul wrote that he spent three years in the desert being taught one-on-one -on -one by Jesus. He had come to understand that any soul with rebellion in their heart would not be granted eternal life. And would not be granted admission to heaven. Therefore, in Romans 6.23, Paul states, For the wages of sin is death, meaning eternal death. <clears throat> but he gives us hope as he turns his audience's mind to grace with the words, 
but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus died on the cross to pay our penalty that we might be covered by his righteousness in the sight of God. But for us to be covered by his righteousness permanently, he must also become Lord in our lives. We are to follow the Lamb wherever he goes. Just as when Jesus was a human being on earth, he followed the Father as he was shown. <clears throat> in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10, Paul explains that, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. And in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus explains to his disciples that, not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do what my Father in heaven wants them to do. We need a faith that works by love and obedience. As the Matthew Henry commentary puts it, having a real holiness or sanctification that is accepted of God, grace and love are a more excellent way than removing mountains or speaking with tongues. Grace will bring a man to heaven without working miracles, but working miracles will never bring a man to heaven without grace. So back to Jesus' statement that not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do what my Father in heaven wants them to do. So my question for you is, how would you know what God the Father in heaven wants you to do, especially in any given circumstance, conversation, or scenario? After thinking on this for a while, my thoughts are, let's look to our pattern, namely Jesus, whose scripture says, left us an example that has been recorded in the Bible for us. We need to follow the example of the Lamb of God, our Good Shepherd, Jesus. So how does Jesus know what the Father wanted him to say or do? In John 5, verse 30, Jesus tells his audience, Of myself I am able to do anything, as the voice comes to me. So I give a decision, and my decision is right, because I have no desire to do what is pleasing to myself, but only what is pleasing to him who sent me, meaning God the Father. So Jesus would send up a silent prayer in the middle of a situation or interaction with someone, and the Father would tell him what to say. In Matthew 4, 4, Jesus says, it is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. The Greek word in this verse for word is rhema, and rhema means a spoken word. So according to scripture, out of Christ's own mouth, man lives by every spoken word that comes from the mouth of God. So when Jesus would ask the Father what he should say, he would hear the Holy Spirit speak to him what he was to say. In the Old Testament, the Israelites were instructed to hearken unto the voice of God. The Hebrew word for hearken means to listen intelligently. It seems to me that we still need to hearken to the voice of God since Jesus is our example and learn how to have the same two-way communication with God that Jesus had as a man on earth. In John 5, 19, we are also told, So Jesus made answer and said, Truly I say to you, the Son of Man is not able to do anything himself. He is able only to do what he sees the Father doing. Whatever the Father does, the Son does in the same way. So there were times when God the Father would also show him in vision what he was to do and whom the interaction would be with. 
In John chapter 8, verse 28, he says to them, When you lift up the Son of Man, you will know that I am who I am. Then you will know that I do nothing on my own authority, but I say only what the Father has instructed me to say. Jesus also told his followers, When the judgment day comes, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, in your name we spoke God's message. By your name we drove out many demons and performed many miracles. Then I will say to, him, to them, I never knew you. Get away from me, you wicked people. In scripture, to know someone was a much more intimate or stronger, closer relationship with someone than most relationships are today. It implies a relationship with Jesus as our Lord Jesus. As a man, a relationship like Jesus had with God the Father. We need Jesus to be both our Lord and Savior. As our Lord, he will give us instructions on what to say and what to do if we will but defer to his wisdom and ask. Many Christians only hold one direction conversations with God. They do all the talking in prayer and God does all the listening. But approximately 60% of the Bible is a record of two-way conversations with the Lord. If you don't have this type of two-way communication with Jesus, you can have it. You have only to truly desire it and seek it. I have found it helps greatly in various situations with other people to be able to send up a silent prayer, Lord, what is your answer? And then I hear it, and that is the answer I give. Thank you for your time today. For now, blessings to you in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Until next time, this is Insights with Carrie.